Hi there, Kathy. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here with you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. I have a lot of questions for you, but I'll try to keep it short and sweet. I don't want to overwhelm you, but it is a great privilege for me to be talking with you tonight. Um, first of all, first things first, Kathy, I'd love to find out about what got you hooked on tennis. What was it that got you into the game? Everybody's got their story. What about you? Yeah, well, it was pretty distinct. Um, I'm an only child. So my parents introduced me to a lot of different sports and activities. And um, when I was eight, my father introduced me to tennis. And then he, we joined a tennis club and uh, it was right before the summer. And I played in my first club tournament and it was open to other clubs as well. And I remember the night before my match, um, my first match ever in any kind of tennis tournament, I learned how to keep score. And then I also, the big debate was, should I serve underhand or overhand? And so then my father's like, you know what? You're young, just go for it. Like you're gonna have to serve like an adult someday anyway. So just do your new serve. And it was the funniest thing because um, in the first round I had to play the very first seed and this was 12 and under. So I'm eight and she's 12 and I'm tiny and she's huge. And for some reason I thought I was going to win the match. Cause I think, you know, when you're little, you just have no, um, uh, I don't know, concept of if you're good or not. So you just assume you're great. And so I guess I had, a, I just had this illusions of grandeur that I was going to win the tournament and bring home the trophy because I was playing it. So if you're going to play, you might as well win. So anyway, um, I lost six, one, six, three, and I was in tears. I was absolutely devastated because my little balloon was burst. And so my father picked me up that evening um, from the club and he's like, well, you know how to go. And I, I told him it, it did not go well. I lost to the number one seed, six, one, six, three. I, you know, I was devastated. And he's like, well, you know, it was your first tournament. No big deal. Um, if you want to get better, you just need to practice more. And meanwhile, I just started playing tennis. So I thought, okay, well, I want to play every day then, just every, every single day. So this was the beginning of the summer. So every time he was on his way to work, he dropped me off at this tennis club and I would go with a whole bucket of balls and my little lunch sack. And I just would spend the whole day there and I would play against anybody who wanted to play. I hit against the backboard. And of course, when I was hitting against the backboard, I thought I was playing against Chris Everett and had all these fantasies going on in my head. I remember one day I practiced my serve 10 buckets. And I mean, every bucket of balls had over 70 balls. So I was just going crazy with practicing and uh, I didn't even swim that summer. And normally I like to swim, but I had no time because I was playing tennis all day long. And so at the end of the summer, there was this um, a team match, our club against the Garrison Country Club. And so we took this bus and all the tennis playing juniors at our club. We were on a bus and we went over to Garrison Country Club. And it was the 18s, 16s, 14s, 12s, girls and boys and it was a long day and I wasn't playing and then the last match was the girls 12s and somehow we were all tied up and this this match was the deciding match of who was going to win the day the Poughkeepsie Tennis Club or the Garrison Country Club so lo and behold the person I played against was the same person I lost to at the beginning of the summer her name's Ann Gilbert I remember her name I will never forget her name and so, of course, all the older kids were like, oh, this is terrible, you know, because she killed Kathleen at the beginning of the summer. You know, everybody had long faces. So going into the match, you know, with everybody thinking I was going to lose, um, it was a really tight match. And it was an eight game pro set. And I ended up winning at eight six. And the jubilation and the cheer and the focus was on me and I was just this little heroine all on, in, in the bus the whole ride back. You know, I'm eight and I have all the older teenagers just telling me how great I did and how happy they were. And 
I love that. And I was like, I want more of this. This is pretty cool. And I think it was not just that by, you know, the joy of victory and the agony of defeat and sort of understanding those two extremes over the summer. But I think the important lesson was tennis was very measurable, unlike some of the other things I was doing, like ballet and, you know, some more subjective things. So then, so you can really measure your improvements or, or disimprovement for that matter. And the important lesson I learned that summer was if you put in the effort and you have the desire, you know, really good things can happen and you can win. And I think that was a really good life lesson, but I think more directly answering your question, that was the moment that hooked me. Okay, great. So you talk about that. So it must have been really rapid your, um, after that summer and doing all the putting in all the work and it sounds like you're really diligent and conscientious about it and you set your mind to it and then was it pretty rapid with your ascent up the junior ranks um well given that I was living in New York State at the time and in, in Hopewell Junction New York near Poughkeepsie and um at the, there there becomes a winter season where you can't play outside every day and you have also school to deal with uh during the school year I think I was only able to play maybe two or three days a week then during the school time. And uh, so I played as much as I could and I started playing some um, sectional tournaments, some Eastern Tennis Association. And again, that, so that started when I was nine. And again, my first tournament, I thought I was gonna win it and I didn't and I was devastated. Same thing happened again. Um, and, uh, I lost to Jill Fenton. I remember her name, 6461, 6164. <laughs> so um, don't ask me what I had for breakfast yesterday though. But uh, so I, that first year, you know, I, I think I was ranked 10th in the East and given that far fewer players played than now, um, that wasn't that impressive. But then the following year when I was 10, I was ranked number one in the East and I think right before that happened, I was given a scholarship uh, to play at an indoor club for free. So I was able to go from playing, you know, two or three days a week to being able to play every day. So I would play tennis before school with a ball machine. And so then it just, things started progressing pretty quickly after that. And I got the attention of different coaches. I had a coach who offered to coached me for free. And so I was really lucky along the way to have people notice me and want to be involved in my development and to give me opportunities to play. So I started playing nationals when I was 10. And by the time I was 11, I was ranked number three in the nation in the 12 and unders. And then every year was just this exponential growth. Um, when I was 12, then I was in, I played the 14 and unders and was number three in the nation. And then when I was um, 13, I was playing the 16 and unders and I was number one in the nation. And that was the summer when I was 13, almost 14, that I won the singles and doubles and the clay court singles nationals in the 16s. But I also played it, at the time it was the 21 and under nationals. And I just played it for fun because it was close to where I was living in New York state. And my father's like, oh, well, you know, this is only an hour away. I might as well play, have some match play. And I did. And, and, and traditionally the winner of that tournament would get a wild card into the U S open. And meanwhile, when the tournament started, this was in August of 1979, I was still 14, I was still 13. So I got to the semis and then there were some rumbling about, uh, you know, this would be awkward if a 13 year old wins a tournament and then plays the U S open. So I think it was making a lot of people nervous. And then I was in the finals and then there was a rumbling like, Oh, though the winner this year doesn't get a wild card into the main draw. They'll get a wild card into the qualifying. And then I won the tournament and then they didn't want to give me anything. So I, then people started arguing on my behalf and they, they relented and gave me a wild card into the US Open. And that was good because um, the US Open qualifying started on my 14th birthday. And what was good about that was I, well, I won three rounds of qualifying. So I got into the main draw and, uh, but legitimately, you know, I mean, you uh, did, you did, you didn't, you didn't yeah, even lose. So I 
right. You didn't, uh, you so didn't I... even lose a set. You didn't lose a set, and you played uh, Simon. Simon was a pretty well known. I mean, the other two, I don't really know. Anne Chevalier and uh, the Czech woman that Ivana, you've been in the Ivana show. Brzozakova. I that's think Ivana right. Brzozakova. That's right. That's I right. I mean. She's, yeah, not yeah. One of the, yeah. she's not one of the Czechs that I know from that period. I mean, I know of Tomanova and, of course, uh, a couple mm. of others from that time. But certainly Bridget's, uh, Bridget Simon was, uh, you know, she had a few really good results. So that was amazing, right, to come through. And I was yeah. looking at the quali- There were quite a lot of people in that qualifying, you know, um, yeah. Yeah. some handy players. Yeah, so that I- was an achievement. Yeah, yeah, and then and then that. Um, so then I played the U.S. Open Juniors, I believe, and I think I lost to Mary Lou Piatek or Alicia Moulton. Um, I can't remember who. And uh, but then I think that winter, I think I I won the Orange Bowl. Yeah, the eighteen and under Orange Bowl. Uh, I must have because I actually was at Flamingo Park recently and I saw my name on the plaque in 1979. So yeah, so that 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 was the year I won. And then I played the International Juniors that the following year and uh, won the French Open Juniors. I was ranked number two in the world. So uh, and then I turned pro when I was 15. Yeah, so it was who pretty was, quick. Who was, yeah. who was the number one uh, ahead of you at that time? Probably. It, it was Mascarin. Yeah, it was Susie Mascarin. You know, oh, it was okay. kind of back then it was a little bit of a toss up because the rankings, they it was kind of they went through them by hand. And my father thought I got like ripped off on that one that I should have been number one. And I was actually number two in the US as well to Kate Gompert. And mm-hmm. these were two players I, eh, you know, that was uh, normally I, w- I would, I don't know that the number two is okay, but it could yeah, have easily yeah, yeah. been number one in both. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, so that was uh where does Nick Bolletieri fit into this? Yeah. Where did he come into the equation? Yeah. Um, I saw I saw the documentary where you commented and you had a, a couple of uh, sage comments, I thought. And <laughs> uh, and um and that was uh that was quite uh uh, an engaging documentary about him and what he did in tennis and uh, how he changed the face, but what about your yeah. um, your connection with him? Yeah, well, um, when I played the 16 and under Easter Bowl, which was December of 78, I was seated. I was see, I must have been seated number. I was seated pretty high and I lost in the semis to Michelle De Palmer, uh, whose father, Mike De Palmer, was Nick's right hand man um, and, and running um, one of the tennis clubs that Nick was uh, associated with and using in Bradenton, Florida. And, um, right before that orange bowl, we were sort of, we had a little bit of a dilemma where I was living in Hopewell Junction, New York. Cause I ran, I basically ran out of people to play with. I had two men, um, that were within 45 minutes from where I played that were good. Um, uh, but I still would beat them pretty easily. So, I I had to travel an hour and 15 minutes each way to get decent practice. And so my father and I, we were just like, you know, it's getting really hard to improve or it might get really hard. So we were kind of facing this dilemma. And at that orange bowl, Nick saw me play. And of course, Nick, (laughs) always sensing an opportunity, uh, came up and he's like, I saw it. I saw you play um, and I'd really un- like to invite you and a, a, a parent to come down and visit me at the, the colony. And uh, if you like it, we'd like to offer you a full scholarship. And so this was in Florida. So of course that the timing was beautiful. So in February, during our winter break, I went down with my mother and he, of course he wined and dined us. And I, I fell in love with it because yeah, going from New York, it was cold and my parents being Eastern Europeans and we're pretty um, uh, of modest means. Our house was always freezing cold. And this was, you know, in the energy crisis days and everything when you didn't turn on the heat and um, just being in sunny Florida with all the good players and Nick basically whining and dining us. I, I just couldn't wait to go. So I went down and I lived at Nick's house. So that started in February of 1979. And so then I 
obviously started playing more and I had Nick totally focused on me, um, thinking I was like the next great thing. Poor Jimmy Arias took a back seat to me and was really, yeah, was, we, we started like fighting a lot because he wasn't happy about that. And we joke about it a lot now, actually. Um, and uh, so with Nick's, whenever Nick believes in somebody, you just feel like you can conquer the world. I mean, he, um, everybody knows he was never a great tennis player, but he was a great coach in different ways. And one of the different ways was that he was an incredible motivator. And if he believed in you, you thought that you could fly. So I had that in my, you know, arsenal, Nick's undying belief that I was great. So that's how it started. But, but when you say that about um, that, he wasn't a great player. Um, isn't that true of most coaches who become great coaches? Most of them, you know, like Borg with Lennart Bergelin. Bergelin had been a Swedish player, had played at Wimbledon, but he had never been a great um, you know, a great player, um, but he managed to get Borg to win on grass. You have people like, uh, even somebody like Connors, he didn't have a coach except his mom and different things like that. Many of the coaches, because it, isn't it all about ego, really about to be um, a coach, you've got to kind of, I mean, I think Boletieri probably had a great ego, but you have to kind of- Huge, I can't even, <laughs> huge ego. Another, like, another postcode, uh, another zip code. But um, but what about? But do you think that's true? That to be a great coach, that actually you don't necessarily have to have been a great player. Oh no, that, that's true. I mean, it's not a prerequisite for sure. Um, you certainly have some great coaches who were great players too. Um, I mean, Goran Ivanišević oh, wasn't yeah. bad, and Boris Becker wasn't bad, um, oh, and Brad Gilbert wasn't bad so um so yeah I would say that it goes there's many different and also depends what you need as a player at, at at the time as well so I think one of the things is sometimes your needs change as a player sometimes you need motivation sometimes you need technique and certainly over the development of a career you need different things at different times so so yes I mean Nick was never a great player and that like I said not a prerequisite um, I think he had a good eye for, for whatever your strokes were when he got to know you. Um, so he, I think he was absolutely able to add value on the court technically. Um, I don't know how it translated to the modern game. Um, cause I, this was a long time ago, but, uh, but yeah, no, he, he was, uh, he, he was a strong personality. That was his biggest thing. Yeah. You mentioned your parents, especially your father, but also your mother going down to Florida uh, with you to meet Bolletieri and everything. And of course, the late 70s um, was kind of the time of the rise of the tennis parent. I mean, you had Paulette Everett who would come and watch. You had Mrs. Austin who would be there. But then you also had, uh, I can't remember, what was it? Um, the father of uh, Andrea Yeager. Um, what was it? Roland. 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 Yeah, Roland. Right. Roland, Ex -boxer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he had that kind of pugnacious look, looked like a tough guy. And she had a sister mm -hmm. who played too, right? Susie, right? Susie, Susie, Susie yeah, Baker. yeah. Um, who then got so, married to Scott Davis, who was a top, who was a top junior player. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Of course. And, and, yeah. and he, he was a good, uh, also doubles, he did some doubles, but anyway, mm -hmm. um, yes. I wanted to ask you about. So your parents, what's, what was the, I mean, you talk about your dad taking you to tournaments and that's often a big part of it, being willing to put the time in and everything. But what other mm -hmm. was, what other factor was important about your, um, your parents and what they did for you? Um, well, I mean, I think, well, they kept saying like, had they had more than one child, it would never have been possible for them to spend so much time taking me places because even though we were Eastern Tennis Association, we were kind of not, we weren't in the nucleus of where all the um, tournaments were. So it wasn't unusual to have to drive two to three hours each way to go play these matches. Um, so they were always incredibly supportive. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, they also instilled in me a work ethic. Um, they're both from Eastern Europe. They both were from co former communist countries. So they both both escaped communism. 
Um, and so they're very pragmatic and very, um, and basically they, if I wanted to play tennis before school, if that's what I said the night before, and then the alarm would go off at six in the morning or five 30 or whenever it was. And I was like, Oh, I'm tired. I really don't want to. They, there was no way they would say like, okay, that's fine. Just go back to sleep. My mother was like, well, I'm up, you're getting up. And if you didn't want to play, then you should have said that last night. So, you know, you said you're going to play, you're going to play. So they kind of made me just follow through on the commitments that I made. So I think they were really good about that. Um, yeah, but they were, they were always really supportive. I always remind them too, that they really, they kind of got off easy because, you know, tennis can be a complete financial drain, which I see so much now. And it really bothers me. Uh, family starting so young, whenever ever, like a child even has an interest in tennis and all of a sudden the kids being homeschooled and everything. Um, but back to what I was saying, my, my parents, um, by the time I was at Nick's, I had a full ride at his place. I had a sponsor and Folger who's a Folger coffee heiress. She was my sponsor. So she paid my travel. Um, so really by the time I was 13, 14, my parents, um, had minimal expenses when it came to my, to my tennis. So compared to what it could have been mm, very very lucky very fortunate but that was based yeah. on what you were producing and what you were doing i mean when you look at other players like you said about the expense even at that time in the 70s you had some players who came from really wealthy backgrounds i think like um austin you know her father what was he like a uh what is it a rocket scientist or something like oh, that I right I, 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 I never I, wrote, Rolling Hills, Rolling Hills, Rolling Hills, California. Mm -hmm. And then you had a uh, Connors, and then you had Everett. Well, I mean, even though Everett was a little bit forward, but her dad was coach. So you had all those different things, yeah. But yeah, the expense of it. Um, now coming to when you went on to the tour, right? You went on to the tour and playing. What was that like, Kathy? I mean, I have seen there's a movie, and I don't know, um, whether you're in it, it's from the 1981 uh, French Open and it's called The French. And it's about like the whole, it's a uh, look, it's available on YouTube and it's all about the French Open that year. And it's like a behind the scenes and you see the women um, sitting in the locker room that must have been around at that time. And you, they're all sitting like together as a gaggle of women <laughs> talking like you got Bunga there, you got Navratilova. I mean, it's a funny thing, mm -hmm. but was there... What was it like being on the circuit at that time? Was there camaraderie? Was there? I uh, I talk about Bunga because I liked her, her the way that she played the game. But she was talking in that clip that I sent you about you can't be friends with other women on the circuit because you don't know if you're going to play them the next day and you can't be too close. What did you find? Yeah, I mean, I think um, my upbringing was a little bit guarded in general. I think. My, since I was an only child, I sort of had instilled in me, like, it's just us three against the whole world, right? Um, uh, so I don't think, and my parents definitely didn't look at tournaments as a time to socialize. So, um, you know, I, I saw I saw it as a very serious um, thing. I mean, it was, well, the fun for me was winning, really. Uh, it wasn't really hanging out with people. Um, and, but I would say there was camaraderie on tour. I did room with plenty of other players and practice with other players. And back then you had to practice with other players because not too many players brought their own coaches with them. Um, some did from other tennis federations, you know, France usually sent somebody. I remember, um, the Dutch players had a coach, um, Australian players would have a coach and I often would train with some of these other teams and they liked training with me because I worked really, really hard. So the coaches liked to include me at sometimes in their practices, but I, I would room. I remember rooming with Elise Bergen, with Alicia Moulton, with um, Marcella Mesker. And, um, and I remember hanging out with Bettina during the last tournament I won the Belgian ladies open where I beat her in the finals. We were staying at the same hotel you know, I know that she likes to eat Nutella for breakfast. And so we would have breakfast and things like that. And uh, so, I mean, there was camaraderie. I mean, sharing deep feelings, no. Um, 
but uh, I, I think there was a difference. I remember from when I started on the tour in 79 and when I ended on the tour in 89 and 79 there, you could always find somebody to hit with at tournaments. Everybody was always looking for somebody to practice with. And by the time I stopped, everybody had their own coaches with them. And there were a lot more foreigners. When I started more than half of the draw seemed to be Americans. Um, so it was a, it was a disproportionate, um, you know, number of Americans, which over the years, it's just become much more and more of an international game. When I started playing, you could pretty much, if you wanted to just stay, stay in the United States and play most of the year, you could, um, and just travel outside of the country, maybe for maybe three blocks or four blocks in a year. Um, so it was, it was much different. It's become much more international, but, um, I thought there was a fair amount of camaraderie. I, I think it would have been more fun if we had more tournaments together with the men. I think when I played, there were even fewer tournaments together with the men than there are now because the Italian Open, when I played most of the time, um, it was in Perugia. And that was, you know, Billie Jean's philosophy was if we play with the men, we get overshadowed. So we have to create or um, basically earn our own existence. And the only way that's going to happen is if we can stand on our own before we then team up. So, so I'd never got to know too many men players. Okay, yeah. All right. Okay. So um, I interviewed once uh, this actress, her name was Jane Burke and she died recently and she had this one song and it was a song that was, she said, they'll put it on my uh, gravestone. It'll be my epitaph. Right. So of course we come to, um, that one match, that iconic match a couple of years ago, the New York Times wrote about it. I finally found actual video of it. Um, the the uh, There's a Pate video that I shared with you. I don't know whether you'd ever seen that before. But um, the match where you beat Martina, right? This This iconic match. I don't know whether it was actually the best match you ever played, but it's certainly the one that everybody will remember and everything like that. Um, and yet, when you look at your record, when you look at your result, especially on clay, and you mentioned the tournament in, in Belgium that you won at the end of the career, that was on clay. And you got to the final of the German Open on clay and you won all these, and you did well at the, uh, you won the French Open Juniors um, on clay. So um, tell me about that match, beating Martina um, and beating her um, and this, this will go. This is in history and has gone down in history. Even though you have all these other achievements, and be, including being until today the youngest player to ever play the U.S. Open. Tell me about that match. What you remember about it? And are you a little bit bored about talking about it? No, I'm not bored about talking. I'm not bored of talking about it at all because I don't talk about tennis that much anymore and i i'm actually really really touched when people remember me at all in any in any <laughs> in any way uh it was funny because i was at um a little uh uva tennis event the other night and somebody was introduced to me and he was just like oh my god you know i remember you and i just thought and he was like i'm so sorry i'm like no 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 i'm 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 thrilled. I mean, I, I'm touched. It's, that's lovely. So no, I don't get bored because I, th I think, um, you know, it's, it, um, it, it's lovely to be remembered. Um, about that match, I was going into it coming off a couple of really good weeks. I had gotten, I think I got to the uh, semis of the Italian Open. Um, and then I did not do well at the Swiss Open, uh, but then I did really well at the German Open where I beat Bettina Bungie, Bonnie Gadusik, Andrea Leand, and, and Andrea Yeager in the semis. And the Yeager match was, it was about 90 degree weather. This was in um, Berlin at the Rotweiss Club. And it, I, it was like a three hour match. I mean, she didn't miss a ball. And back then there were different balls at different tournaments and the German red clay was pretty heavy and they used pressureless balls that puffed up into like grapefruits. I mean, they were just so heavy. And so every point was just draining. And so I won that match. And then the next day, the weather, and in Europe, in Northern Europe, if, well, you know, yeah, if the course. sun doesn't shine, 
freeze it's freezing cold yeah. so i went from 90 degrees to 50 something degrees and i was yeah. so sore from the previous day that i felt like i couldn't even walk the next day everything hurt mm. and there was no nice warm weather to warm up my muscles um so uh i re- so playing against chris and for some reason the finals was on it was on a monday um uh, i remember and- i've actually watched i've watched the match it's on youtube right the whole match is on yeah. youtube and uh, yeah, it looks yeah. really cold. It looks so cold. It was cold. so cold. I just remember everything in my body was hurting that day. And nonetheless, it was a good, it was seven, six, six, four or something mm. like that. And uh, it was a good match, but I kept thinking like, oh gosh, I mean, if, if it was warmer, if I didn't feel so sore, I probably could win this match. By the way, I had two match points against her at the Italian Open when I was 15 in 1981. And actually i won that match i found out about it a few a few years ago but that's a different story so okay. um yeah so going into the so so going into the french open i was feeling good coming off of some great tournaments i had no time to relax because i had tuesday was my travel day and then wednesday i had to play my first match and i don't remember who i played and I, I won my first match, second match, third match with no days off. And then I had to play my fourth match on Saturday, which was against Martina. And so basically, I think I just didn't have time to just sit and think about anything. I just um, just kept playing. And I, I remember warming up for the match at the racing club in Paris. And it was a beautiful day when I was warming up, at least. And I just one of those days where you feel like you can I could hit any sp- spot on the court everything felt just right um i really wish i remembered who i warmed up with but i can't maybe it probably was a lefty um maybe it was eva budarova i don't know um and i just was in that match and and i just had nothing to lose and my favorite surface to play against her was the slower the surface the better because i didn't have to deal with that lefty serve post just and then her coming into net and just hitting the volley to the open court. So I remember my strategy was given that I felt like I could place the ball like two inches from the baseline. I just thought I'm going to hit every ball really, really deep. And um, when she hits a short ball, then I'll come in. And so that's what happened. Um, I was just pinning her to the baseline. I mean, she wanted to come in, but she was just never close enough because I wasn't hitting any short balls that day. Mm. And um yeah, I won the first set. And then I started thinking, I was like, oh, shit, I could win this match. Uh, and then my hands started shaking. And before I knew it, I lost the second set 6-0. Mm. And I thought, well, this isn't good. Well, you know, you don't get any credit for just winning a set, which I learned, you know, after I almost beat Chris and didn't. But um, so I uh, just thought, just play one point at a time. And um, it worked out. And yeah. the, the one of the biggest things I remember from that match after, um, I forgot what she said. <laughs> I think she might have said like, you know, in in jest, she's like, "Nice match, bitch," <laughs> or something like that. You know, I mean, it was it was it was funny. But what what I really remember was back then. You know, we didn't have cell phones or anything, so whenever. Um, I would call home. It was like a collect call or something. And yeah. I remember getting my father and I, and uh, I said, Oh, you know, uh, Hey, I won. He's like, what do you mean you won? And I said, Oh, well, I just beat Martina. And he's like, well, n- you didn't have a date. No, you don't play today. And I said, yes, I played. And he's like, Oh, so you won a few games. And I said, no, 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 no. I won. And he's like, oh, you won a set. That's really good. And I'm like, no, I won the match. And I remember having, and, and then he's like, well, that's not possible. She hasn't lost all year yet. And she's number one. And so I just remember having a hard time convincing my father that I actually won the match. So mm-hmm. that that was the thing I remember most, like just trying to convince mm-hmm. them that it actually happened. You know, what's funny is that I actually, when I found that, Pathé, um, the British Pathé uh, video that I've never seen before. It suddenly came up like the last year that shows excerpts, right? And it does show you coming into the net, swinging volley. Um, and you do, even from the short sequence, you get this feeling like Martina's really panicking, right? And you, there was always that feeling too that 
I felt like Martina was brittle, even at when like um, Chris Everett has often said that she was the real bitch, Chris was, and that Martina was the more emotional oh, yeah. one, oh. wearing her hair yeah. hard on her sleeve. And um, I even saw yeah. there's a there was a tribute to Sue Barker from 1996, and then Chris says something. Well, I never thought you were a rocket science, so I'm surprised you're doing commentary, you know, something like this, right? So it's like so. <laughs> wow. Oh yeah. Oh no. Yeah. No, but, it's but, so fun because but, pub the public completely been fleeced about like who's the nice one and who's the bitchy yeah. one um, yeah and chris will definitely make your make people blush and but back mm. to the tennis part um yeah. no but what you yes. were saying is i'm sorry what you what i was saying is that like you'd seen martina crumble against austin in the uh u.s yeah. open right you'd seen her yeah. lose it to uh um, you know, other people, what was it? Oh, Sukova, but that was later. She lost it to Sukova mm -hmm. in the Australian yeah. and, and things like that. Uh -huh. So she kind of had a, you know, she could be, like they say, wear her heart on her sleeves. Now, that's something that you've mentioned before that you kind of thought if you stuck in there that she might start to fold a oh, bit yeah. or she panic yeah. would set in. Yeah. No, she would, I mean, you know, when he played against Chris, she just, uh, it was like an, impenetrable wall and and no you would never sense that she was like getting flustered or anything but martina like if you won the first game against martina she'd start looking at her box like what do i like just she and sometimes when she acted confident it was almost a, it always always felt a little fake um so i was i guess i was on to her too because i and so i knew if, if you just stay even with her, I mean, she can get so tight. And so you can definitely get free points. Um, yeah, she battled her, her nerves a lot on the court. And I think I always felt that there was like a lot of self-doubt there. Um, and yeah, if you could hang with her or pull ahead, um, the trouble is always like, maintaining that right but mm. you definitely felt like you were getting somewhere with martina whereas with mm. chris ever yeah, yeah you know yeah. you know you never felt that she was giving you anything mm. Mm -hmm. um what about uh and then the next round you played yosevich who was quite a oh, handy God. player quite a handy was... mima quite a handy player i mean a good doubles player too but she had yeah but i i, I but I beat, okay. I beat, I, I beat her before going into the match. Mm. That was, that was, that was so bad. That was so, that was so bad. I love Mima. She's a mm. tough player, but I mean, the only way you lose to Mima is if you beat yourself, basically. I mean, at least with my game, if I match up, I mean, I'm going to, if, if I make a, a lot of errors, I'm going to, I'm going to lose that match. And I could not find that the court. And I think the biggest problem was back then I really didn't have anybody telling me what to do. I, I, I was there with my mother. I had no coach. Um, and I had a day off after I beat Martina. Oh, so and that's when I start. Well, not only did I start to think, I said yes to every damn interview and photo shoot. I was on top of the Eiffel Tower. I was like in some field with flowers, with art sites, having pictures taken. I was reading the my press of everybody saying that I was going to win the tournament, and I could have, um, but I completely was not dialed in anymore after that match. And mm. the match against Mima, it was on the the bull the court that doesn't exist anymore, that bull ring court. I was, I was terrible. It was one and one. It was, it was, it was just, I couldn't, after the match, I just, I, I was so embarrassed. Um, and like I said, Mima's a really good friend of mine and she's, she's a great player, but uh, it shouldn't have been one and one. Okay. Maybe one and one for me, but. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, Kathy, you continued playing, and of course, you uh, you got to the third round of Wimbledon. There's a great photo on Getty when you had lost to Chris at Wimbledon, and uh, but then you played that tournament in Belgium, 
Um, similar to you, Bunga finished her career after, you know, at a relatively young age, but you were even younger than Bunga. What what actually led to you um, deciding to hang up your racket in that sense? What was it? I read in the article in the New York Times, I think it was the New York Times or something where the profile they did a couple of years ago where you said you were kind of disillusioned with tennis. Was that the case? I don't know. I think I was overworking and, you know, I was having diminishing returns and, um, oops. Is this, is this it? Oh, is this it? Is that... I don't know. Probably, you know, probably <laughs> one of my 20 photo shoots that day. <laughs> Getty, Getty, has uh, a, Getty has all these photos of, here's some weights and we don't know who he is, but, um, I know. That... yeah. There's, there's I am I am certain. Yeah, that's for sure. For sure one of the photo shoots like the day after. Like uh, ridiculous. Just ridiculous. They, have, um, a they yeah. have a photo of you also getting like a uh, street artist doing your doing your picture. Oh god. Yeah. <laughs> there was one of anyway. me flying uh like on my like jumping over tennis rackets. There was one lying on the grass with my mother. Those were, it, it was ridiculous. It was stupid. Anyway, stop. But anyway, yeah. yes, yeah. Uh, uh, so, I, so I think I just was, I was, I was training harder and harder and harder and not enjoying it more and more and more. And I, I, again, you know, I was training at Harry Hopman's at the time and I didn't have any individual coaches and it, it was just a different time. And I think I was just really dry, training myself into the ground. And I just remember, gosh, there were some tournaments that I'd just get there exhausted. And see, the problem was my philosophy was always outwork the competition, right? So the problem is that works fine up to a point, but then you're able to push yourself so much that then you kind of lose the, the, the common sense of when too much is, when it, it's too much. And mm -hmm. uh, so I think things got a little out of whack and overtraining. And then of course, if you show up tired at a tournament, you're not going to play your best tennis. So I think at that point I was thinking, gosh, you know, what should I do after tennis? And I always thought I was going to play till 30, but then I, I thought, uh, well, you know, I started young, I might as well stop young and do something else. Um, so I decided to go to college and, uh, I was uh, under the illusionment that it would be really fun having a nine to five desk job and not being outside all day. So I think you don't appreciate what you have or what you're doing until you're not doing it anymore. Mm -hmm. So not to say I have any regrets, but um, you know, it's, I think it's just, yeah, I overtrained and was like, okay, what else should I be doing? And I like, I like, um, having do-overs. So I, I didn't want to do something in tennis. I want to do something completely different. Mm. So, mm. and you went into uh, finance and all that amazing business. Uh, you, you, you know, well, were... sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I wasn't, I didn't go to college with, with finance and business in mind, actually. I, I thought I was going to do, um, I thought I was going to be a doctor and I, I pre-med, but then when I was in chemistry class at an Ivy League institution, at, I was a 25-year-old freshman at University of Pennsylvania, and I had never, my last three years of high school were correspondence courses, which were completely out of a book, and it was multiple choice, so I, I didn't learn anything in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, so in chemistry class, I don't know what was going on, and I thought, wow, if chemistry 101 is giving me this much anxiety. I don't think a medical career is in my future. So that's when I looked at um, the Wharton Business School and uh, transferred into Wharton undergrad and then also got my MBA there. Amazing, great. I mean, there were, we mentioned Bunga, we mentioned other people whose careers were cut short by injury, Jaeger, um, uh, what's it called, Austin. And then there were other people like Caroline, uh, Caroline Stoll, I think, other people oh, yeah. who, were, yeah. Yeah. who were around that time and then just um, didn't really make it through. I mean, she had a, she had some really, I think the German Open in the late 70s, et cetera. And then you had some people who were like 
journey women like the Mary Lou Piatek, who you mentioned and you kept on uh, playing. Um, but when you look back at your career um, and you say you, you kind of take it for granted when you're in it, are you are you happy that you had that time and all the foundation that it gave you in your life? Yeah, no, it's uh, absolutely. Now, um, of course, you know, if I were to do it all over again, I'd do it differently and enjoy it more and have good, better balance in my life. But it certainly opened up doors. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it continues to bring some attention once in a while. And it's something where if you get to the top of anything, it commands some respect because there's an understanding that you um, have learned the ingredients of being great at something. I mean, yeah, I wasn't number one, but um, I mean, being top 10 in the world in anything um, that right. there's something to be said for that. So I think um, it, it, it commands a bit of respect that I, I enjoy. Um, and uh, I think also it did teach me life lessons of hard work, even though I often took it to an extreme and continue to do so in other areas. Um, but I think a little crazy is good. Okay. <laughs> and I think sometimes it's the little crazy that is that little extra you need for excellence. Um, so, uh, you know, I wasn't, I was absolutely not the most talented person out there and not the most athletic. And I, sometimes I look back and I'm like, how did I ever have any success in tennis? Honestly, um, because I was not, I don't consider myself athletic at all. Um, I was kind of a girly girl. Um, not that big, not that, not that small, not that big, not, not, not strong. Um, and I mean, I like tennis, but I, I mean, I, it wasn't an obsession. I think the obsession was being as good as I could be. So, um, but when, when you say yeah. that, do you, do you often think that tennis and like, um, is a lot of tennis more about the luck of the draw literally and figuratively, figuratively than actually about great talent, if you get what I mean. Right. I mean, sellers, um, sellers, uh, I used to be good friends with a tennis player in Indonesia called Yaj Basuki. Yaj Basuki was a player in the 1990s. Oh, yeah, I remember her name. She's had a mm -hmm. beautiful game and she got to number 19 and I was communicating with her today, actually. Um, she nearly beat Sanchez all these times, but Sanchez would come back and always get it, Sanchez Vicario. And, she, you know, to get to number 19 in the world takes so much. To get to number 10 is another level all the, you know, all entirely. But uh, what she was saying about Monica Sellers was that she had such, she was the toughest player she ever played against, not the most talented, perhaps naturally, but just so tough because her mind and her uh, resolve was incredible, right? So do you think mm -hmm. that often it is about the luck of the draw, like, you know, um, uh, what's it called? Sometimes you get a great draw that leads you to get through and have this great run to a title and also the luck of the draw of you meeting Bolia Terry or him seeing you, or do you think yeah. so much of that is about it? Yeah, I, I would say I would use a different, I would say the stars have to be aligned, uh, which is basically saying this, almost the same thing. Um, because I, I do believe you make your own luck, um, but you do have to stay injury free at the right times. I mean, you look at some players who just, you know, they, they might've been something had, um, they not had injuries, um, or, or earlier on, or, um, I think, I think, yeah, you, the, it's definitely not all about talent. That's for sure. Because I just remember my, my whole tennis experience, I would see unbelievably talented people, um, who are way more talented than I, I ever was, but some, some of them were just stupid <laughs> or, 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 uh, lazy because you have to, I mean, you, you can sometimes talent is, 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 yeah. is tough, you know, it can really bite you in the butt too. So, but you have to have a certain, there has to be, a, there's a lot, there's so many ingredients. So it's like, if you don't have that much talent, then hopefully you have more desire that makes up for the talent, um, or finding a way problem solving skills. Um, there's so many things that go into, um, 
you know, yeah. making somebody successful in anything really. And yes, who do you meet along the way? For sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. I think I should wrap it up. I've got one more, a couple of more questions and that's it. Already? Seen... Already? <laughs> Your son's probably ready to go to bed now. He's probably like, hey, no, I'm no. Ready. I mean, what, what you, no, what, it's, it's early here. It's, I understand. Oh my understand. gosh. We've been talking for almost an hour. See, uh, this is, this is why, this is why you ask me, do I ever get sick and tired of things? Do I look sick and tired of things? Uh, no, clearly I haven't talked about tennis in a while. So I'm like, uh, what do you mean? We're done. <laughs> hey, I wanted to, ask, you know, um, of course, with that French Open 1983, one of the things that you've mentioned before is that Rene Richards, um, who was a pioneer in her, in her own way in tennis and um, uh, and uh, Nancy Lieberman were getting into a fight. And of course, that points to the fact that Martina with Mike Estep and with everybody else and with uh, Nancy and with uh, Rene, um, she really ushered in the whole thing of having um, these entourages that have now become the norm in tennis that have changed the game so much. I mean, you used to just have, you know, Gloria Connors sitting in there and uh, Colette, uh, whatever, sitting there and whatever. But now, of course, you have the whole entourages that came along. Um, and so that has changed tennis. And also you were mentioning before about in the 1970s, you had so many joint tennis uh, tournaments. You had so many tournaments where you had men and women playing together, whether it was Queen's Club, it used to be a joint tournament. And now, what do you think? Uh, what do you think, Kathy, about the right. fact? Sorry, I'm getting tennis? out of I'm getting out of the, the sun. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Uh, tell me about no. what is uh, what do you think about the way tennis has changed? And in fact, there's now talk about having more men's and women's tournaments together to kind of create, I don't know what they're trying to do, like synergy or, or what they're actually trying to do with that. I know there's rumors about the WTA tour being yeah. kind of uh, dire straight financially, but tell me, what oh. do you think when you look at tennis today and the women's game? Well, I mean, I think, uh, well, half of the time, I don't know who the heck is playing because all that there's over this and over that. And uh, um, so I, I think part of the struggle remains the same where, uh, you know, everybody just cares about the top players. And I think um, the, the sad thing about tennis still, as this is probably off topic a little bit, is so few people can really earn a good living. Um, you know, I think the, one of the, the only sport that I can think of where it's fewer um, the sport that I follow is, is formula one racing. Right. So, um, you know, it's, it's really sad that unless you're ranked in the top hundred, you can't really make a living at it. And when you talk about the big entourages, you can't afford it unless you're well in the top hundred. And I think Andre, uh, uh Rublev says he spends between six and $700,000 a year just on his team. <laughs> and expenses. Um, so, you know, I think that's always going to be a struggle, the haves and the have nots. And, and that's what happens in the individual sport that I think tennis is hard. It's really, really hard. And it's really hard from an early age too, because when you're not in a team sport, you know, you can decide everything, or if you have crazy parents, they can decide everything and they can decide, um, that, oh, wow, you're, you, my, my kid likes tennis, they're six years old. And so we're gonna move the whole family to Florida because if you move to Florida, that'll make you great. Um, so I think, I don't, I gotta say, I don't wa watch a lot of tennis. I go through spurts um, and I just lost tennis channel because we had spectrum. So I was watching it again. And then all of a sudden we didn't have the channel anymore but I do go to the US Open every year. Um, oh, I went to Croatia this year to watch Davis cup, but that's, um, men's tennis. Um, so, I mean, I do enjoy watching it. Mm. I can't say I really follow it closely enough to know what the health of mm. tennis is or what some of the challenges are, you know, in terms of the organizations and such. Um, but like everything else, it kind of waxes and wanes in terms of, 
you know, the different countries having good players. I know the United States, I follow, you know, I got to admit, I follow men's tennis more than women's tennis, probably because I have a son who pursued tennis and um, he was very good um, in in the nation. So, um, and plus, I don't know. I just, I find, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it. Uh, For me, I find that in the past, women's tennis, you could see people working the point more. um, And then for a while there, I thought everybody was playing the same. They were staying on the baseline and bashing the ball as hard as they could. Um, Ans Jabor does not. So that's different. But I find in the men's game, I'm seeing just a lot more variety and working the points and angles and drop shots. And now with Carlos Alcaraz, who is just such a pleasure to watch. Um, Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. He's such a pleasure to watch. And, you know, it's, it's interesting what I find, what I find a little bit surprising in tennis is, is you go to the U S open and everybody wants a ticket and Wimbledon too, and, and the French open. And I would imagine the Australian open too. So in a way, the tournaments, those tournaments have gotten more famous than the players in a way where people just want to go to those tournaments. And then you go and then you see some of the tournaments that are not Grand Slam tournaments or maybe not some of the like Palm Springs. And there's nobody in the stands. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that that's disheartening. And it's been like that a lot for, you know, I remember playing tournaments in empty arenas at Virginia Slims of Detroit. And during the day, nobody's there. Um, But, uh, you know, so I think there's always going to be that challenge and that of how do you grow tennis and that challenge of how do you make it interesting? And, I think the public usually, unless you're such an entrenched tennis fan, Mm -hmm. the public usually only wants to watch the top players. So that is challenging. And that gives the top players a lot of leverage if they want to get a bigger cut. That being said, the goal, in my opinion, should be to grow tennis, right? And to Mm -hmm. make it um, give more opportunities to make it a more of a viable career for more players. So I kind of wish that was more of a focus. And, and I, I do see Djokovic sometimes talking about that. So I think there are some top players who actually care about um, the players who are barely scraping by, but there are a lot, there's a lot of inequity in tennis, you know, um, the top players can just keep having more resources and more resources. The top players go to tournaments. They don't pay their hotel bills, right? Mm-hmm. Because the hotels are like, oh, just stay at our hotel. Mm-hmm. And uh, we'll use a little blurb that you're staying at our hotel and you can have as many rooms as you want free. And then the person who just got out of qualifying is trying yeah. to find the cheapest hotel so they um, can make ends meet. So. Yeah. I probably got off the topic of your question. Never mind. Sorry. No, no, no. But I, I, I think that, uh, yeah, what you said is it, there's ups and downs, there's different personalities. You mentioned, uh, um, I interviewed once a long time ago, an Indonesian tennis player who was active in the 1970s. And she did not get, she was not, uh, she got to the, like the last 16 of the Australian Open She got uh, lost to Evert at the Italian Open in 1974 and things like that. But what made her different and got her attention and got Ted Tinling to dress her and stuff was she was ambidextrous. So she could, the fact that she was ambidextrous and you had in the early 70s, two players who were ambidextrous. Um, One was from Holland, Marika Shah and her, Lita Lim, who she's still alive, Ibu Lita and... um, you know, that gave her something different. You talk about Jabur, you've also got Muchova, Muchova from, um, uh, what's it called, uh, from uh, Czech Republic. Czech. Or... Yeah, and she's got a she's, beautiful game. Actually, and she's, yeah. yeah, she's my favorite player, actually, right now. Yeah, uh, she's, she's kind of like got a bit yeah. of Manlik, she's got a bit of, I don't know how you say it, Manlikova, Manlik, I always said Manlikova, Manlikova, mm-hmm. but... You know, she's I got that, that whole all-court yeah. get flowing game, that kind of a bit of Bunga, uh, mm-hmm. Bettina Bunga mm-hmm. kind of thing. Um, uh, but uh, um, I do remember, um, but then you also have the other players who were kind of like the also-rans, like in your era, I saw 
Sam Casal, who you played and lost to at the U.S. Open. Did oh, I just say God. that? No, no, no. That was that was that was Wimbledon. And oh, yeah, Wimbledon, again, that was, sorry. That, that was one of my worst. Yeah, I don't. Yes. Shame on you for bringing that up, because in the juniors and like I would never lose to Pam, like never, oh, ever. That's and the reason I, remember I remember that that match. That that match took like three days. I don't know. It rained so much. Oh, and then by yeah. the time we played. Uh, what year yeah, was that? She's a tricky she, player. Well, I don't know. I, she, was, she was interesting because she came from New Jersey and she would always play mm -hmm. the Mawa tournament. There was a tournament near where I yeah. lived in New Jersey called Mawa. Yeah. At John Corf. John Corf. Yeah. Yeah. And John Corf. Yeah. Anyway, but you've always got those different elements, like you said, and that's great to have. All right. Pam. Oh. I just said Pam Garnett. Pam oh, Schreiber. no. <laughs> okay. Pam Gasol, Pam Schreiber. There's a lot of Pammies yeah. around. Pam T. Garner. Right. Um, right, anyway, yeah. Kathy, I really appreciate it. Um, And I will say goodbye to everybody. Take care and thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks.